the adjusting to the circumstances. That's fabulous. Um, this is our last conversation session of 2020, which is mad. It seems funny that it's the third one. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, is, is that me giving the feedback like on the mic? Well, that's probably because I'm not muted, maybe. Oh, there we go. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, for those of you who don't know, my name is Ellie. Um, I'm the president of the UOG Refugee Support Society uh, at the University of Gloucestershire. Um, I've been working with Isabel so far this year and Cheltenham Wildwood Refugees to put this together as part of our sort of planning and awareness raising and advocacy promoting um, for students and this series has been really successful so far so thank you all so much for coming um, if you have any questions for me as the as part of the society please let me know um, and I'll pass over to Isabel thank you Quick hello and uh, thank you Ellie. Um, I'm here from Cheltenham Workers Refugees and we're absolutely delighted to be doing this with the Refugee Support Society so thank you Ellie. We've got lots of things, uh, lots of events and programmes to work with asylum seekers and refugees in Cheltenham. Um, we've got a fundraiser at the moment to fight uh, digital poverty among the asylum seekers so it's one of, just one of the many things we're doing at the moment but we're pleased to have this series and uh, especially delighted to have Tom here today to talk to us. Tom, you're on mute. There we are. Um, great. So, um, yeah, my name is Tom McKinney. I'm a GP trainee here in Gloucestershire. Um, I've had a very interesting pandemic. Um, as junior doctors, we move around um, different wards and departments. So I spent the first half of the pandemic working in A&E and the second half, um, since August, I've been in a GP surgery working in Gloucester. So the, the focus has very much changed now to the, the vaccination programme and how we're going to achieve that. But anyway, we're not going to talk about that at all, um, because uh, in 2018, I went to Bangladesh to, to lend some support to the Rohingya refugees. And I spent about five months there. And my, my task, my job is to summarise that five months experience in uh, maybe 30 minutes, um, leaving a, a few minutes of questions at the end. Um, so it's going to be a whistle-stop tour and I guess the first thing to say is that I, I worked with a charity called Mercy Malaysia which is um, slightly perhaps an um, obscure charity. It, it works a lot in Southeast Asia, it's based in Kuala Lumpur and there's a small branch in London with mainly uh, Malaysians, uh, expats who do um, sort of small, you know, good charitable deeds and um, essentially I got involved with them as I was working at the Evelina Children's Hospital with a Malaysian paediatrician. Um, and I happened to say that I was interested in working overseas and she said well next month I'm going to Bangladesh um, feel free to join me um, and so I did and I stayed for five months um, so just to, you know just as an example of another thing that the Mercy Malaysia UK branch has been doing recently is this um, is the PPE handouts um, that was something that they were able to organize very efficiently through their connections through Kuala Lumpur um, so just an example of some of the sort of deeds that they're doing so then straight into the sort of geography of the situation of the Rohingya refugees, because it's not been very well covered by um, BBC anyway. Um, so Myanmar we have on our right, and I think most of us are familiar with the geography, and Bangladesh on the left. And most of Bangladesh is bordered by India, with a very small uh, border with, with Myanmar itself. And, and Myanmar, or Burma, the names are fairly interchangeable, um, it, uh, is, is an interesting country in itself. And then that red area is the Rakhine State or Arakan area, which the Rohingya live in, where they come from. Um, and, and then just over the border is Cox's Bazaar region, which is the area they fled to. And I'll show you a bit in the timeline about that, how that went in a moment. Just to zoom in on Cox's Bazaar as a region, you can see there's, uh, there's a sort of main city uh, there on the coast, which has got a little airport, which is called Cox's Bazaar as well. And, and most of the refugee camps are, are down in the southern sort of tip, um, right close to Myanmar. We stayed in, in the city of Cox's Bazaar and every day we commuted through Ukia down to the refugee camps. And that, that journey um, depended a lot on traffic because there was a lot of humanitarian organisations coming backs and forwards. Um, it could take between an hour and, and two and a half hours depending on the traffic. This is the team I was working with. There's the Malaysian flag, um, a group of Malaysian doctors, sort of uh, the gentleman 
um, to my right or the screen left is, is our sort of logistics organiser um, and, and it's a, just a, small, a fairly small team of people working to provide primary health care to the Rohingya refugees and I'm looking very fresh face there having uh, just stepped off the plane. I'm just going to show you a few photos first of all of Cox's Bazaar city itself. This is, so this is Bangladesh, this has nothing to do, or, or this city has nothing particularly to do with the refugee camps. Um, but just the first real point that I want to make to you, an important point, is that this is Bangladesh. There's, there's you know, it's, it's, it is still a developing country um, and they've had to absorb these refugees in a very short space of time and a vast number of them. So, so, the, so the real emphasis here is that you know, about 85% of refugees around the world are being hosted by developing countries, and, and Bangladesh is, is is an example of that. And this this is this is the city of Bangladesh uh, or Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh. This is this isn't a refugee camp. Uh, I particularly like the pest control services. I think they've got their work uh, cut out. And uh, I quite, sort of quite like this picture because it demonstrates the two methods of waste disposal in, in, in Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh. It seems to be that you either set it on fire where it is or, or you chuck it into a river and that's how you get rid of that. And I shouldn't be too negative because Bangladesh is, is a very beautiful country as well and this is the, this is the scene as we drove to the, uh, to the refugee camp um, on, the, on the, the more picturesque paddy fields. Um, and as I said, traffic was busy. This wasn't an uncommon scene. Um, road traffic accidents account for a lot of deaths in the in the developing world. Um, laws around MOTs and seat belts and, and that just don't exist. Um, and it certainly taking overtaking at high speed uh, seemed to be a, a sort of hobby of the of the motorists. And then we move into the refugee camps itself. And this is this, this is essentially what it is, but going for miles and miles tarpaulin structures with, with bamboo holding it together, um, very little space between them. And if you look in the background, you'll see a sort of hill with, with some trees on. And if you try and imagine in your mind's eye, that actually that, this whole picture in front of you would have been rolling hills with trees on. The, the original scenery here is a sort of green lush landscape which elephants would roam. Um, and all of that's been flattened and, and, and taken over now as part of the refugee camp. Um, here's some of the, the, the locals then. Some of the, uh, the children, which are most friendly. Um, Ellie, you're studying education, aren't you? And then and, and UNICEF had a, a big role. We can talk about that later if you want to. Um, and I guess this, the second important point I really want to emphasize is, is just the sheer scale of the situation there. This is the world's largest refugee camp. Um, and it just carries on into the distance uh, as far as your eyes can see. So just to give you a, a very brief potted summary about the Rohingyas as a sort of a group of people, um, they've been living in that area of what, what we now call Myanmar for, for a long time, several centuries, and what was the Arakan Kingdom. Um, the British uh, had colonial rule up until 1948. Um, and, and then the next thing to, or important thing to, to appreciate is that um, the Rohingya had been fleeing persecution in Myanmar for a long time um, and there was a smaller influx in 1977 and in fact in 1982 um, the, the Myanmar authorities decided that Rohingya were no longer citizens um, so for the last what, 38 years any Rohingya that you see in the photos less than 38 years old is a citizen of well nowhere um, they're not allowed to be a citizen so I think that's a, that's a really important point that the, the Rohingya have been persecuted for, for many years and certainly this sort of um, most recent influx and you can see there have been a few different ones um, but the, the huge one with several hundred thousand in 2017 was just sort of the, the sort of the, um, the pinnacle of years and years of persecution in perhaps the same way as we, we might think of you know the, the second world war and the holocaust as being perhaps um, the sort of pinnacle or summit of years and years of persecution against the Jews because that didn't come out of nowhere um, and I think it was back in 2015 the, the UN said that the most persecuted group of people within the last century were the Rohingya which, which sort of perhaps 
surprised me because I knew little about them, um, but that it wasn't, say, the, the Palestinians, um, but you know, or, or any other group of um, uh, ethnic minorities. So just to show you the map again, this is the Cox's Bazaar region again, and and in in red there you can see the sort of original refugee camps. There's a red splodge in the north and a red red splodge in the south, and those were the those are the original refugee camps. And then in 2017, after a um, almost alleged organised assault on on Myanmar military checkpoints, um, Myanmar responded in force by then what's now been termed ethnic cleansing by then forcing out. Um, huge swathes of Rohingya, and you can see that it, you know all that blue area, all the blue settlements there, is the new um, settlements. And there's some 700,000 people that have moved in, and they did that over the space of about one or two months. So we're talking about 10,000 people each day crossing the border. And when you compare that to say a year ago, last December, the Home Office. Uh, declared a state of emergency because 100 people had sailed across the channel to the UK. That's 100 people in the space of a month. This is 10,000 people every day crossing the border for about uh, one or two months. So just vast, vast numbers of people. Um, and of course, you know, they didn't just cross cross over the border, did they? It was it was an organised um, attack, and several thousand MSF. Here, one of their original surveys estimated that 6,700 Rohingya were killed, um, and at least 730 of those were children below the age of five years. I don't, I don't know how you want to do any questions or anything, but um, now that that's a sort of brief summary of the situation, and and then I'll explain what I went on to do. If there are any sort of questions now um, about any of that, feel free to unmute yourself, or otherwise I'll just continue and we'll take questions at the end. Great, well, we'll just carry on. Oh, no, sorry, Maggie, go for it. Sorry. Hi, good evening, everyone. Sorry, my um, computer's a bit slow, so when I go to mute myself or unmute, it takes like an extra five seconds for some reason, so apologies for that. Just a quick question. Was this your first visit to Bangladesh then? You'd never been, or, or your first visit to a third world country as such? I'm just wondering. Um, this was my first visit to um, Bangladesh, okay. but my second third world country visit after Ghana from which this picture comes from. So when I was a medical student, I was, um, I went to Ghana for two months, um, about halfway through my studies just to learn more about the situation or, you know, how healthcare is provided. Um, and I learned a lot there about, oh no, I'm on mute. No, you're okay. I could hear you. Okay, good. Sorry. Um, so that was my second one, and I guess you know I, I haven't perhaps introduced myself fully. Up. I've also worked in Australia for a year in the emergency department there. Um, I'm I'm half Swedish, so I've also worked in Sweden in a children's hospital for a year. Um, so that's not quite the same, but so my sort of interest in in travelling and and medicine abroad, um, I've, I've had various experiences before Bangladesh, but yeah. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Maggie. Sorry, did I see your hand? You, you did. Uh, sorry, it might be too, uh, a question requires too long an answer, but briefly, uh, what, what, does the, what does Myanmar have against the Rohingya, as it were? Is it ethnicity? Is it religion? Is it political? That's a good question. I, th I think it's both. I think it's both ethnicity and I think it's religion as well. The, the, you know, the Burmese sort of mainstream or about 85% are, are Buddhist. Um, they have a very different culture to the, to the Muslim Rohingyas in, in, you know, as, as, as you can expect. Um, so I, I, I think the short answer is I think it's both the religion and the ethnicity. Um, but I think the cycle of persecution that they've been forced to live in um, you know, uh, poor accommodation. They've been forced not to have an education. So some, I think about 15 years ago, the the Burmese said that they weren't allowed to have a university education anymore. So it, it's this whole question of, um, they're almost reinforcing their own prejudices um, by uh, by putting these things in, in place. So it's a sort of a self-perpetuating cycle. And, 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 and perhaps someone will ask me at the end, um, where do I see it finishing? And, and I can answer now, I've got absolutely no idea. Um, but the future is, you know, the future is bleak. Um, 
and, and their current situation is just as bad, if not worse, than when, when I was there. Which was about, so I arrived in February, which was about six months after the influx, I should say. So that's, that's sort of important to think about, you know, the, the, the sort of how people were, were sort of starting to settle in Bangladesh, actually. Well, so I'll carry on then, and um, I'll come back to any, any more questions. Um, so my job was to be essentially like a GP out there, and I worked with other doctors, and there would be four doctors working at one time, um, and, and we provide primary healthcare, which is about disease prevention and treating of minor illnesses. So, so just to be clear, we didn't, we didn't have any inpatients. Um, we weren't a hospital. It was all outpatient basis. Um, um, so this is me and the three other doctors that are working. Um, and, and our clinic was just very much like the rest of the camp. Um, behind me, you can see there, that's our clinic. Uh, it's a bamboo structure with tarpaulin. Um, and before the clinic started, we had just taken opportunity to speak to the, uh, to the to a group of patients, I suppose you'd call them, uh, waiting to see us. And that was an opportunity for a bit of health education. Um, and we cover sort of what we might consider quite simple topics about diarrheal disease and washing your hands. Um, uh, the importance of uh, uh, you know using the latrines that have been designated, not um, just fairly fairly straightforward, or what we might consider straightforward things. But to, to a group of people who have, have absolutely no education or very little education, um, some of that was 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 sort of a new concept to them. And just for example, we also um, we also talked to them a bit about family planning, and that was a completely new concept um, to them. You know, the concept that you could you could actually choose how many children you wanted to have was a completely new concept. So this was an opportunity just to educate um, about some simple health topics. Um, and it, we could also talk then about so like weather reports, for example, you know, there's a, there's a big storm coming on Saturday, um, you know, these sort of things just to prepare the community. So it was useful. Um, and this is me at work, of course, and, and, and the lady you can see in, in the foreground with the back turned uh, towards us is the interpreter. The, the interpreter's from Bangladesh, he's from Cox's Bazaar region, and because the, the, the Rohingya dialect was reasonably similar to the Cox's Bazaar local dialect, um, she, she could translate fairly well, and, and she got better and better as the months got on, grew on of, of learning the language, and she was absolutely fantastic. Um, and sometimes I would just say, um, give the usual diarrheal advice, and she would, she would explain to the parent how to give the rehydration salts, um, the hand washing, all these sort of all these sort of things, and, and she, you know, they were just fantastic. Um, and again, here's my colleagues all working, uh, doing very similar. Most of the medicine, I should say, that we did, I, I would call fairly straightforward medicine. It was simple uh, infectious diseases, um, diarrhea, uh, skin infections uh, like fungal skin infections from overcrowding, things like scabies. Um, again, from overcrowding, you might consider scabies to be a bit of a almost like an STI, um, but that's just a close contact thing. Um, uh, things like chicken pox, um, what else do we see? A lot of coughs and colds, a, a, lot, of, a lot of fairly simple things. I'll just show you a few, a few other cases now. Um, this child, I think, was about nine months. Um, and as uh, you know, red is never good in, in the medical textbook. Um, this, is a, this is a very simple malnutrition screening tool that we have, which is validated between six months and, and five years. Um, and you can just measure their bicep and, and, and it should be in the green, of course. And it, so this child's got severe malnutrition um, and, and, that, and that's simply just access to food. Um, this child and, um, is, is perhaps um, two years old, three years old. And, and as you can see on his right cheek, his right cheek's quite swollen. And, and if there are any students listening, you, you're probably more familiar with this than mm, many people because this child has mumps. Um, mumps is quite typically portrayed as being bilateral uh, swelling of the parotid glands which are in front of the ears um, but actually I mainly saw it on one side and, and then it would spread to the other or some cases it just stayed on one side but it's a simple viral illness and most children um, it doesn't do them any, any particular harm it's more, more of an issue when you become an adult um, but mumps I haven't seen in the UK um, and, and perhaps I never will but I understand that there is a bit of an outbreak at Gloucester Uni. Um, this child is, um, has got this uh, burn on his abdomen. These sort of injuries are fairly common. Cooking was on an open, open fire. 
um, his, his bones healed really nicely and um, there's just a bit of overgranulation tissue there you can see that sort of flower shaped um, uh, scarring which is a bit more prominent um, but that will heal well and, and shouldn't cause him any problems but he'll have that disfiguring for life won't he so um, I assume his t-shirt caught fire at, at some point um, this this I uh, um, Isabel asked me to focus on slightly because and because you should all be familiar now with um, disease outbreak curves. You've all seen this in the news. This is a, this is just like the outbreak curves you've been seeing for coronavirus. Um, so you can see at the bottom of the, the graph, these are the months. And at the bottom, you can see November 2017. So that's just after the, the big influx. Um, and then a big peak in December. And then it sort of settles down as, as we take measures to uh, control the disease. And, and the disease in this outbreak curve is, is diphtheria. Um, diphtheria is a bacteria which causes a uh, sort of throat infection, a laryngitis. Um, most cases are mild. Occasionally, the inflammation can get so severe that they, they physically can't breathe, and, and, and you do, you, there isn't a mortality associated with it, but it is a sort of uh, fairly low numbers. We don't see this in the UK, we don't see this in Europe at all. This is a, a just like mumps, is a very easily. Um, Sort, sort, you know, it, we vaccinated against it, essentially. Um, every child in the country has been vaccinated against it. Um, and, and I think this comes back to what I was saying, you know, 10 minutes ago about the Rohingya being a very persecuted minority. Um, this is, we shouldn't be seeing diphtheria, really. There's no reason to see diphtheria. It's so easily avoided through vaccines, but you have to have a functioning healthcare system. You have to have a functioning uh, vaccination system. Um, and and I guess the the other parallels we can draw between the diphtheria outbreak and COVID is that the way we get on top of the disease outbreak is exactly the same as we've done for COVID, um, namely isolation and a sort of track and trace system. So when in December, when that peak, um, you know, at the highest peak, um, a couple of organisations, I think M and M MSF, sorry. Um, set up isolation hospitals um, and any child um, suspected of diphtheria was put in the isolation hospital. The MSF would then organise a, uh, a worker, a Rohingya worker, to go and visit the household that that child had come from to then inspect the other children's throats, look for any sign of diphtheria in the other children and give them antibiotics as well. So that's a isolation, a track and trace method and and then ultimately, the the you know the WHO organised for vaccine rollout to to them to get this get this under control again. Um, and if we've got time, as it's very topical, I've got two vaccination short vaccination stories that I'll just tell you from the uh, refugee camp. Um, firstly, is um, I met a young child um, with a high fever. Um, and we were just trying to work out why, why he had such a high fever. And he just happened to say, could it have been because of the, the vaccinations I had yesterday? Um, and I said, well, vaccinations, what do you mean? You, you should have had one vaccine for, for the diphtheria. Uh, and he said, well, well, I had five of them. Um, and and, and the, the reason is, is that the, the sort of methodology for giving out the vaccines was, was they would go through systematically through each area of the camp. Um, and they would look for children between uh, whatever it was, I think three months and um, six years. And, and, and if you said you had that, you were of that age group, they would vaccinate you there and then on the spot. Now they learned their lesson because during the second wave, after they vaccinated the child, they, they dipped their finger in ink so that their finger was purple um, if they had been given the vaccine. The second uh, vaccine story I'll tell you is then they did three over the course of this graph they did three waves of diphtheria vaccination so for covid we need we know we need two vaccinations for it to be effective and that's the same for MO, the mmr for example we need two vaccinations for diphtheria you need more and um so at the end of the three waves we had something like half a million needles and syringes that then needed to be disposed of um, and the WHO had sort of assigned people to um to, to incinerate those um, which is a time-consuming process. Um, they only had small-scale incinerators, so they decided that they would sort of shortcut this system, um, dump these half a million needles into a sort of dried-up old riverbed, pour diesel over the lots, set fire to it, um, and that was going to be their that was their method of disposing of it on on the sort of cheap. 
Now, unfortunately, um, that doesn't work very well, as you might imagine, and you're left with a, a dried up riverbed with a million vaccines in that are now slightly charred. <laughs> a couple of issues then. The wet season's on its way and we're expecting rains very soon. Each needle potentially has, you know, is still a potential source of contamination. And, and we know there's a lot of hepatitis, particularly hepatitis C, um, in the refugees collecting up these needles again was going to be a huge task and we were time limited by the um, by the fact that the monsoon was coming um, so I guess long story short I think someone from the Red Cross sort of took charge and organized for cement to be poured over the lot um, and I think that was probably um, a sensible pragmatic solution so moving on um, these are some of the symptoms or sort of sort of more quirky turn of phrases that we heard. Um, there was a rat in my legs. This was a this was to say that I was getting a lot of muscle cramps. Um, I cannot see the face of rice, and, and that's not really a symptom. That's just because the World Food Programme were giving out sacks of rice and very little else. And after you've eaten rice for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day of the week, you you know, as you imagine, you get pretty sick of it. The other things that some symptoms which are really common, which I haven't touched on yet, was this sort of I can't sleep sort of feeling. I've got I've got absolutely no energy and I've got no appetite, um, and th those are all very physical symptoms. But ultimately, this is a this is a psychological illness, um, and this is how the, the Rohingya refugees would describe their their depression essentially, um, or the stress that they're that they're facing. And this seems to be a cultural thing that. We, we can talk openly about being um, feeling sad, um, but different cultures don't describe feeling sad. They, f they describe having no energy. So I just want to touch on the sort of mental health side of things, and in particular the, the fantastic work that this lady did, um, who's uh, Malaysian, um, she's a psychologist, um, and she was absolutely fantastic at sort of doing these little psychological first aid sessions where she would organise for um, you know, a roundup of, of anyone who wanted to listen. And she would just talk to them about, about sort of, just explain to them that it's okay what they're feeling, validate what they're feeling, um, because I can imagine it's quite quite confusing um, for these people that perhaps have no concept of, of of depression or stress. Perhaps they might not even have a word for it, but but, but just to explain to them that, that that's absolutely okay. And and here's a here's a picture then of, of, of the men were given a little, little little sticker and were asked to vote or, or, or choose which symptom they were feeling most often. And on the left, you can see that it says, I, I feel hungry, I'm eating a lot. Um, and then the next picture along, you can see I feel empty. And then the next one along is, uh, I feel ashamed. And then the last one there on the right is that I'm crying. And, and so I'm crying a lot. And, and, and that's quite telling, I think. So the symptom that these men were were hiding or or keeping was that they were that they were crying um, and I think that's that, that's really valuable that that you know uh, Jamea the psychologist there can just just talk about it bring it out to the open and, and sort, sort of normalize it and that then allows people uh, to move on a bit and she was just fantastic at um, building up rapport And just very briefly, this isn't this isn't anything to do with the Mercy Malaysia that I was with, but this is a this they called a child friendly space. Now um, that term, a child friendly space, is a sort of I sort of thought was a slightly odd turn of phrase. Um, but children, of course, they don't do counselling and therapy sessions. Um, they do play therapy, and in fact, you don't need to call it you don't need to call it therapy. You just call it play. Play is how children get better. And all you need to do is create a safe space for children to be together and 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 simply be children, and and they will, um, they will grow up and and they will, to sort of learn to put behind them the experiences that they've suffered, or, or the vast majority will at least. Um, and I've read some sort of interesting U.S. Uh, U.N. sorry UNICEF reports to say that these children, when they first entered these child-friendly spaces, were drawing pictures of helicopters and soldiers and houses on fire. And then over the course of a few months, they start to draw flags and trees and animals. Um, and it just shows that sort of normalization and uh, process that they go through through play. Um, I guess now is probably a reasonable, just sort of brief break then if there's any questions.
that's fine. We'll we'll just we'll just crack on. But sorry, Tom, can you hear me? Sorry, I can hear you. Okay, sorry. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, when the children were sort of in the child friendly areas, what sort of work, what like what other things were being done with them? I can imagine that's quite a difficult thing to sort of approach as a practitioner, like how what were the support workers or practitioners sort of doing with them as well? So so in in, the, in those contexts, they were literally just facilitating play. So they had board games, they had pencils and crayons and, and paper. They weren't doing anything more advanced than just giving them space and time and some supervision for them to play together. Um, and and that, that, that is very simple, um, but it is very effective. Um, mm -hmm. and that's how you do it. That's how you sort of encourage children to be children and ultimately they can, they can recover. Does that make sense? Yeah, lovely. Thank you. And Tom, how the work you were doing kind of coordinate with other charities and other organisations that are working out there. So if you were doing kind of effectively outpatient work, I wondered how that coordinated with other medical services or um, provisions. Um, that's a really good question. I'll come on to that one slightly later because I've got some photos to show you. There we are. Right. So I'll move on, and I just so I want to show you this um, this photo of um, a gentleman called uh, Amir Sultan, and um, this is his 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 family. This is his cow, and he lived behind the uh, one of the the clinics where we worked, and he would help us sort of manage the queue of patients and this sort of thing. Um, and I just want to point out to you here that 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 is his house um, behind behind him and and I just want you to appreciate here the difference between his house and say further down the line to the far left you can see the sort of that bamboo structure the tarpaulin yeah, I mean sort of his house has got you know a corrugated metal roof it's got cement walls um, you can see there's some bricks there and and you know perhaps just think for yourself for a moment so why does this gentleman why does he have house shall we say um then then the refugees living all around him and i guess when i've done this presentation to my colleagues in the past they've sort of said to me things like oh well is it because he's he's got more money um and i guess perhaps in a way uh, he does but the key thing here is that this this chap isn't a rohingya he he's a bangladeshi he's a local bangladeshi and and he lives in this house so then the next question you might ask yourself well why is this Bangladeshi living in the refugee camp? Why is he living next door to all these refugees? Why, why has he chosen to live there? And he hasn't. He hasn't chosen to live there at all. He's lived there for 40 years. And this comes back to my first point, is that Amir Sultan has lived there for 40 years. He didn't go to the refugee camp. The refugee camp came to him. And his cow now has no grass to feed on. Uh, his cow's not producing milk anymore, and he's now a poor Bangladeshi made even poorer. So I just want to show you this slide, and the numbers are probably a bit out of date now because I took this back in 2018. But if you look at the, these figures on the on the left, then it's 300,000 Rohingya sort of scattered around uh, Bangladesh, um, some of them in Cox's Bazaar, and then almost 700,000 new arrivals, um, then most of them between August and September of 2017. They felt that there might be another 80,000 um, sort of possibly coming over soon. But then look, there's also another 336,000 Bangladeshis who are now in a much worse position. So when the UN is sort of talking about their um, the overall budget or the number of people that needs help, yes, you've got almost a million Rohingya, but you've also got 300. 36,000 Bangladeshis that are now in a far worse situation than they were to start with. Um, so that comes back just to the to the original point. It's just it's really important to understand. I'll just touch briefly on the sort of rainy season. So I arrived when it was when it was dry and very hot, um, but as the rainy season came, sort of in in May, June, July, um, there was some there was a lot more awareness and talk about preparation, and the. There was a lot of education campaigns going out into the, to the Rohingya communities um, to start sort of, how to say it, putting ballast on their roofs with these sandbags um, and, and 
there was a survey done, a sort of geographical survey to look for which areas were going to perhaps landslide during heavy rains and which areas were going to flood. And the UN and, and Iowa made some concerted effort then to move people um, out of the area um, where they thought there was going to be a big flood. Um, and here they are sort of building channels. I thought this was quite a comical picture with their little, um, those are sandbags that they're wearing as hats. Um, and they were sort of planning ahead, trying to mitigate the, the, the rainy season that was cut to come. Um, and it certainly did, and it changed the way that we thought about disease, because of course, with all this water around, um, there's a lot more contamination between um, sewage and fresh water. Um, we thought a lot about vector-borne disease, so that's mosquito-borne disease in particular. Things like dengue fever, chikungunya, or mosquito-borne viruses um, that they like to breed in, in, in the water. Um, and, and at that time, that rain was, was, was really quite torrential, and, and some people did um, did lose their, their, their new home, shall we call them, um, because of it. And so this comes back to the, the question just a moment ago about the, um, the coordination. Um, quite often when we see public like fundraising campaigns for various charities, it, it, they almost make it sound like they're working alone um, in whatever far-flung corner of the world it is. Um, but that, that's, that's rarely true. This, this is a meeting that we held once a week between all the, the, the health um, sector charities. So there's representatives here from, from all the different charities representing healthcare. So people like MSF, people like Red Cross, um, the Turkish had a field hospital, the, the Malaysian army had built a field hospital. Um, and this was a forum for us to all share information about um, you know any and also about any disease trends and patterns that we saw but also about referral processes which hospitals are the ones that have got an obstetrician um, in case there are complications in, in pregnancy which which hospitals um, can take the diphtheria cases um, which ones have got a general surgeon um, so this is how we you know we work together and coordinate the responses um, and, and that's really important and in the past this hasn't been done well and in particularly um, one that's always quoted is, is the 1994 um, response to the Rwandan um, genocide there there was no coordination between the groups there were disease outbreaks um, left to flourish because the different agencies weren't working together so this is this is just so important um, and it's so important that we go out there as professionals and and uh, we're not going out there as sort of people on goodwill alone that, that this is a, a an extremely complex and ethical uh, situation um, and and we were reminded of that constantly when we give whether that's our time our money or or, or, a, or a resource um, we take responsibility really for what we give um, it, it's, it's not the onus is not on the recipient to then say um, you know um was it worthwhile or not we we need to take ownership and 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 actually make that decision along with the recipients you know what do they actually want what do they need um so it's about giving respectfully and and, and if we've got time i i can tell you how i learned that um the hard way and just my i think this is a, the final slide here is it's just emphasis as well that um the you know the rohingya they don't want to be there they're, they are refugees. They're not. They're not there to earn money. They're not economical migrants. They're refugees. They're fleeing persecution. And I don't know if you can just about read the hat or the you know the sort of tiara thing he's wearing, but that says not Bengali. They don't want to be there any more than the Bangladeshis want them to be there. Um, so I hope that summarises the Rohingya refugee crisis in in sort of 35, 40 minutes. Um, and if you've got any sort of last questions or thoughts, then I'm happy to take them. If um, if you've got dinner going, then I won't be offended if you leave. I've got another question, Sam. Thank you. Um, just want to say that was that was fascinating, really interesting. Thank you for taking the time of putting that together. Um, I just had a question on your last slide there about how. Um, if there was tension between those communities. So we saw that there were some Bangladeshi houses within the camp. I mean, did, did you ever witness um, trouble or violence or um, tensions over spilling? I didn't, I didn't witness any. 
but there's, there's a massive tension. Um, there's also a huge tension in that each NGO, each charity is bringing in thousands of pounds, perhaps millions of pounds into providing you know, relief for the, the Rohingya. And as every time we would travel to the camp, we would drive past dozens, hundreds of very, very poor Bangladeshis that were equally um, probably deserving um, of, of the charitable deeds. And, and that created a lot of tension. The, the only difference I'd probably say in it, between those two quite poor populations, the Rohingya and the, and the Bangladeshis, is that what, one of those populations has got a, a, a government which sort of functions and, and should be supporting their community. And if they fail to do so, then, then that's, what, that's what the country's doing. Um, whereas the Rohingya are, are in their situation purely by force alone. And on your own, um, you summarised population numbers, and I think you, you, you brought the figure of, um, of kind of requirements up, up to over a million because it included the Bangladeshi host communities as well. Is that considered in, when, you, when you're talking about aid from various charities in the UN, is that considered as a total or are you, is there a kind of advocacy piece that, that it should be considered but isn't? The UN were working very hard to, to help the people that had become just even poorer because of the situation. So the, the food relief, for example, was also given to Bangladeshi families that had lost their land um, because there are now you know, tents and structures built on them. If, if that Bangladeshi family can't grow their rice anymore, um, then that seems absolutely fair that the UN helped them as much as they did the Rohingya. Um, and the other things, for example, the, um, those, that, that far-flung corner of Bangladesh, the, the diphtheria vaccination program or of the country didn't, didn't, didn't cover it so well. So the WHO were very keen to, to vaccinate the, the Bangladeshi children in the same way that they did the, the Rohingya. Thank you. Uh, perhaps um, one thing that I've just forgotten as well is that I, I do have a very short video to show you, um, which is three minutes long. I don't know if we should just do that because it puts a little bit of life behind um, some of the photos. Um, do, 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 how, do you, is that all right? Yeah, I think go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so the video is just a short, just short collection, a, a montage, if you will, of different clips that I've taken uh, when I was going around the uh, refugee camp. Um, there's no... There's no words, there's just this the song from one of the schools playing in the background. Um, let's see, where's it gone? Um, I need to open it up again. Oh dear, technology is getting the better of me. I'm going to just sort of minimise this if I can. So, can you still see my screen or not? We can see the last slide. So I don't know if you're sharing the PowerPoint or your screen at the moment. Ah, here we are. Hold it. Here we go. Right. Try that. Yes, perfect. Ha has that changed? Okay. So hopefully this works. And this is, like I said, just a short um, series of clips that I've taken.
Great. Um, any other thoughts or questions at all? Uh, can I just ask, please? Um, did you did you see much of maltreatment, physical maltreatment, um, of by you know, f that had uh, been applied to them uh, back in Myanmar? Yes, we, we there was we could see some. So there were sort of burn injuries. Um, there was even one chap who had been shot. Um, though there were some physical injuries. Um, I think you know, the vast majority of the injuries or the people that I saw because they'd survived um, was was psychological um, injury and psychological harm. And one thing that we haven't talked about at all and sort of quite deliberately as well is that just because I'm not sure what the audience is tonight, but we know that when the Rohingya fle fled the country, that there was you know, not just physical violence, but also sexual violence as well against them. Um, and and we know that that, or we know I met women and 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 even um, men, which which shocked me, um, that had been victim of that violence as well. Yeah. When we talk about violence as well, you know, and your question was about violence from the you know Myanmar authorities and um, or you know the the army there. Um, the other thing that we sadly saw quite a lot of is is actually domestic violence. Um, within the Rohingya communities, and, and unfortunately, you, you, you see a lot of domestic violence wherever you see, wherever you find poverty, um, and, and, and that's very true of this population. Um, and, and that was also hard to see because not, it, because it's almost um, how can we say it? You know, out of the frying pan, but you're, you're you're now into a fire where 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 you're in a hopeless situation, and, and you've got all this frustration and anger, um, and, and unfortunately, people are taking it out on each other. Sorry, hi. Um, thanks for all the information that you've shared with us this evening. It's been fascinating because, like you say, it's not really covered very well in the media. So it's nice to hear of your first hand experiences, even though they weren't nice as, as to speak. Um, I know you don't have the answer, but you would have been with professionals um, at that time and perhaps in your in your sort of everyday bits and pieces that you're involved with now. What does the future look like in a year, two years, three years? Like, you know, does it just does it just remain like this or are there programs in place? I don't know. What what do you how do you think? I, I think the future looks worse. The, the the Bangladeshi government are quite keen on this idea of putting as many Rohingya onto this island called Basan Char, which is uh, sort of off just off the coast of Bangladesh in the in in the ocean there. Um, they've created a sort of um, you know warehouses where or, or barracks perhaps where where the Rohingya can live. Um, so so they've and and they've started moving people onto this island by force. So you know I said earlier I think the the future looks looks actually even worse than it does now because um, most of the Rohingya I spoke to, although they wanted to go home, they were actually quite glad to to just be safe. Um, but this sort of now forced movement towards this island um, feels like a sort of a whole new, fresh um, sort of assault on 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 their on their rights. Um, I, I really don't see them moving back, or at least not moving back safely back to Myanmar. So I think, unfortunately, they, they'll probably be sort of tried to, the Bangladeshi government will be trying to contain them um, as best as possible, and, and that will be in probably on the island, and then any that don't fit on this island will be still in Cox's Bazaar. Since I've left, they've created um, big fences around the, the camps now, um, because they're very keen to, to control this population because you know they're still sort of saying in Bangladesh that this is a temporary problem um, when I was there uh, the, the Rohingya children weren't allowed to learn Bangla in their schools in the sort of UNICEF schools because because they weren't going to be there long why bother learning a language when you're going to be there for a few months sort of thing um, and I think that's probably still the attitude um, unfortunately Thank you. Um, Tom, sorry, would you mind um, just stop to stop sharing the screen, please, and we can see all the participants for questions. Thank you. That's lovely. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions, anyone? 
Hi, Chris. Okay. Hi. Well, just to thank you, Tom. Um, I think that I've learned a lot, and I thought that I knew something about what was going on in that part of the world. Um, and it's just really to thank you for coming and joining us and sharing your experiences, as depressing as they are. Thank you. Um, you're very welcome. It, it wasn't all uh, depressing. I think, um, you know, I learned a lot and, and every day I was uh, astounded and amazed by the remarkable resilience of the Rohingya people, actually. You know, I arrived there, the pictures that you were seeing were six months after they've just been forced from their home. That's, that's an amazing achievement of, of the Rohingya people that they've created a whole new settlement um, which, which you know which functions reasonably not you know not brilliantly but within the limits of, of the situation so um, so the thing that certainly the things that I've taken from the experience is I've learned an awful lot about the you know, you know as I was saying the ethics of, of humanitarian work um, about how the different organizations work together to, to, to perform their response um, so, so I've certainly got a lot out of it. It's, it's not entirely altruistic going there. It's, it was a fantastic experience for me. Thank you. That was one of my questions I was going to ask. What did you get out of it? You know, amongst all the hard days um, and the not very nice sights that you would have seen on a personal level. But the, as a whole experience, can you tell us just maybe some highlights? So I, th I think probably, um, yeah, probably th like three, three main things as I was saying. So the firstly is that um, I, I, so I went out there expecting that I would see lots of medical conditions that I, I would, hadn't seen in this country. And, and I saw some, not a lot. So from some sort of medical perspective, um, seeing mumps and diphtheria was interesting. So I learned something there, um, but not nearly as much as actually I thought I would. The learning really came from um, understanding the, the, the response issue, how a humanitarian response works, how the different organizations work together with the UN and that organizational aspect, that's that's really what I learned most about. And then that third element about the sort of sort of greater, um, more philosophical side of it about actually and the ethics of what we're doing as well. Um, because anybody can turn up um, with you know with with um with some aid or some gifts but actually is it really wanted and and i uh, i alluded to a short story earlier and I'll, i can just elaborate on that briefly and so essentially um as i was saying when we go to the refugee camp we would we would drive past plenty of very poor bangladeshis and there were some bangladeshi orphans that we would see in the city um that were always in the same place in, in the same street and those children we decided you know we can't just keep driving past them why don't we have a little whip round amongst us um, as a group and, and we'll get, get them some, some, some t-shirts and some, some flip-flops and then they've got something to, something to wear and something for their feet. So we gave that to them and then the following day um, we saw them and they were selling the flip-flops and selling the t-shirts um, and the initial response there is you know you know you know of anger perhaps shall we say um, little little you know so-and-sos but actually this is what this is what I was saying actually I've given something that they don't need and I've given it off, off my own prejudice that I think every child should have a t-shirt um, and how, how, how wrong to think that and, and you know, impose that on this, on this child because actually if I just asked the child um, he would probably say I'm hungry I want some food um, or just give me the money and I'll buy you know I'll buy, the, <laughs> buy some food when I when I do feel hungry um, so that so that's a lot. I learned a lot about that side of thing as well. Thank you, Tom. Um, anyone else have any questions? Okay, Isabel. I think if we're, if we're nearing the end of questions, my main question is, what do you want us to do or learn? Do you have anything, any call to action? Um, because we talk a lot about refugees and um, what we can do for them asylum seekers locally but is there anything else you'd want us to hear or do? Um, that's a good question I think just by, by the sort of sheer virtue that you're here and listening you're trying to learn broaden your minds a bit about the situation is, is just sort of fantastic because I guess that's that's part of part of the problem is that say you know BBC is, is quite narrow in, in what it what it broadcasts um, and it's actually only if you look outside that that you start to learn about all the other problems in the world. Um, the, so perhaps the only other thing then to say is, is a bit about 
you know, what I was saying is it when we are working with refugees and asylum seekers, um, it's it's just so important to have that conversation about what, what do they need and what do they want. And I think from what I've seen, Cheltenham Working with Refugees does that very well um, because you're very specific about in your emails what, what you need. Um, and, you know, the most recent one was about sewing machines. So I can see somebody's asked for a sewing machine or, you know, it's about gym membership for, for the, the young lads that, that wanted to do exercise. So I think I think um, actually uh, as an organisation you're doing very well just listening to the needs of, of your of your of the people that you're trying to help. Lovely. Any final questions from anybody? Thank you. Um, I have one. Then just to finish, um, you kind of alluded to something educational earlier and I think a lot of the things that um, come up for us when we're studying is sort of like this holistic approach to working with learners um, and in particular sort of my experience with refugee learners is that um, as you mentioned like their sort of psychological needs it's it's really difficult for them to talk about it in a way that we're familiar with like the dialogue and sort of the semantics around it are quite different um, so I just wondered from a medical perspective, because it's something that in our sort of, in our countries, we are still struggling to talk about. So how is it that it's accessed and sort of dealt with over there in a way that's really sort of productive and helpful? So how do they get a, a, a useful education? Is that, is that, is that what you're... Um, sort of an education around sort of their mental health and how mm. how maybe to protect it because it is quite a fragile thing i imagine so i think the short answer is that they don't get any of those sort of um considerations um the schools were run by by uh, unicef or the unfpa and and it was you know large classrooms and and they would only do primary school um you know children that needed a secondary school education simply didn't get one and the the one or two slightly more educated that have been fortunate for, you know fortunate enough to get to the capital city and had an education of the Rohingyas were, were really worried because breaking that cycle of sort of poverty and um, desolation and things is so difficult when your children aren't getting an education. So the the UNICEF programs did pretty much what what you saw in the video at the very beginning. It's about singing songs, um, learning a few words in English. Um, learning how to count, um, but it was extremely basic and, and it was no by no means a sort of tailored to the individual at all. It was a one size fits all um, and, and that is a, that's a big concern. Uh, the only other sort of slightly saving grace to that situation was that as part of the Islamic culture, the imams would hold uh, teaching sessions and um, sort of learning about the Quran um, and they would learn Arabic from the imams. So, so that was a sort of slightly higher education that they could could get. Um, through the, the the imams, the Rohingya imams themselves. So, so that, um, that was probably that that is their education opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Is is there are there any more questions? Sorry, just before we kind of say thank you. No. Cool. Um, well, thank you very, very much, Tom. That was really insightful. Um, will we be able to have a copy of your slides, please? Um, ping, ping them over to us. Um, we'll make the recording available on social media and all around. So um, please do keep an eye out for that. And if there are any follow up questions or anything that we can, can do, please get in touch with us. Um, be really grateful to hear from you. So thank you all very much for coming. It was really valuable, Tom. Thank you.